there's just one of these on there. Oh, yeah, so. okay. um, but I thought, to start with, actually, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit also about what you did before your degree, before you did your foundation, your degree, mm. because I feel that that has had some bearing on how you've yeah. pursued your career later. Yeah. So can you tell us a so, little bit about that? So, uh, before I met Judith, uh, I, I, I'd been making kind of high-end furniture for maybe uh, since 1986 uh, or something, six or seven, I had become increasingly disillusioned really with the, what hard work it was um, and enormous overheads that you have to cover in order to make furniture, um, which is why, in a way, what I've arrived at doing now partly was a conscious decision to have a very low-tech setup. Um, I mean, it was when I, when I made the decision to kind of, you know, do this, I, one of the things running in the back of my mind is that I wanted low overheads. Um, there were lots of very practical decisions I made. Um, uh, I wanted to very little machinery um, because I'd seen, I'd worked in a lot of workshops where the owners of the businesses have basically become slaves to their overheads um, and it ended up, you know, making kitchens and cutting up MDF um, to pay off their loans. Um, so, yeah, so I'm not as low tech as CAT, but, you know, I do have uh, very little in the way of machinery um, and I occupy a reasonably small space, bigger than anyone else. <laughs> But it's still relatively quite small for someone who works in wood. Yeah, so the f my first kind of foray into exiting the furniture world was to do, to do this foundation course at ECAT, which was run by this incredibly sort of energetic, charismatic uh, Tony Bowen, who is still around. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so, so that, that was pre-Judith stuff. Um, and, then, and then after we all graduated and we first started working at Blue Monkey, yeah. you were making this very different work, weren't you? These little I was, tiny I was, yeah. miniatures. Have you, are there any no, in the box? No, there okay, aren't. we'll look in the box in a minute. Um, uh, yeah, I, w I left <coughs> Brighton making what I called uh, like these miniature realities, which were very exact models of everyday things. Um, and I was doing that in conjunction with, I got a job at the Bartlett, didn't I, mm -hmm. when, we, when we moved into Blue Monkey, almost exactly the same time, I mm -hmm. seem to remember. So I was teaching in London, I think, one day and then two days a week. Um, yeah, and I was making these exact, replicas of things like wheelie bins and uh, carry bags. Carry bags. That was my favourite. Yes. I, was, I did look for that today. Did you? <laughs> Too small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Wycliffe's carry bag was the size of, a, of my fingernail, or smaller yeah, actually, yeah. and perfect in every way. Yeah. In wood? In no, 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 no. This was... Okay, this, this, in wood. None, none of this had anything to do with wood, okay, really. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was just about whatever material was most appropriate, really. Um, but I was missing wood. Um, and uh, so, and also it was, it was the time when 3D printing was starting to make a presence. And I noticed kind of going around degree shows and at the bar where I was teaching, they started to use 3D printing. And so the novelty of seeing very crisp models was starting to kind of, well, become less so, really. Um, although, you know, to a trained eye, you could tell they were 3D printed and they couldn't 3D print and stainless steel and things like that. It, it still, the whole, the whole miniature thing started to um, become less surprising and also, I was actually getting very bored of making them. Uh, 
And it was a real sort of endurance thing, wasn't it? It really was. I mean, the the idea, coming up with the ideas was fun, and then I found actually executing them just became a bit of a task. Um, You mentioned that you made a conscious commercial decision. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think that's a very relevant thing about, um, and, and a very important thing about why you have been sort of successful in some ways because you made this yeah, very, yeah. No, very I, definite I, decision about what you were going to do. I mean, I do remember, you know, I was sitting at the bench and uh, kind of, you know, coming to the conclusion that I didn't really want to carry on doing what I was doing. And I wanted to get back to wood as well. Uh, and so, and I, I kind of felt like I had to get serious or get a proper job, really. Um, uh, so I kind of, you know, I decided to try and make a living, you know, like a proper living from it and to stop teaching at Bartlett, which was becoming increasingly kind of unsatisfying. Uh, and so I, yeah, I mean, there were various things I decided. I said I was, I decided I was only going to do wall hung work because people have wall space. I'm not, I wasn't going to do 3D work. I was going to keep it very low tech, so the costs were very low. Um, and I also, you know, subconsciously was always thinking about the market, you know, um, making things that would be attractive. Um, that's become less so. Um, but uh, that was definitely, it, I was definitely wanting to sell, basically. Um, and I also think I needed the, uh, the kind of validation of, of, you know, someone giving me cash for my... <laughs> and, I, and I know that a lot of people don't need that. It's quite a sort of needy thing to need, I suppose. But um, I, it, was, it was an important part of the, of the decision, I think. So yeah, so I, I stopped doing the miniatures and I, and I did two things. I applied to the Crafts Council to join, to exhibit Origin, which was a show that the Crafts Council used to have at Somerset House, which was a very good show. Uh, I applied for that and I did something else. And I, I think I decided if, I, if, if the Crafts Council accepted me, I would just you know, go for it. And um, I did get accepted. And so I just, I just kind of completely focused my efforts on making a body of work that I could put on the stand. When you applied for the Origin show, had yeah. you already started making these pieces? What, at what there, stage did you start There's one these? piece up there which I asked you to put up called West Terrace, which is the street where I live. And um, it was the first piece I made of any size, um, and it was made from roofing battens that were in the front garden of a neighbor, neighbor of ours. And it was the first success, I suppose, uh, and it was the one that led me to doing what I mainly do now, um, which is just, which was always, um, kind of central. It wasn't a completely mercenary decision. I did want to, the, the whole point was to try and kind of show the inherent beauty of timber, really, in all its forms, um, and as simply as possible, uh, and not to make furniture, which felt like a distraction. Um. Perhaps you could just very, just quickly talk a little bit about the what would you use? Because obviously that is an important piece of the work, isn't it? That yeah. you, how you select your wood. Well, uh, the, the key to each piece is called, it, well, the place where I found the timber provides the name for each piece. So uh, that is called Methwold Fen. Uh, and that is because I found the timber, or well, the timber was pulled out of the uh, Norfolk Fens um, at, in Methwold. Uh, and so the source of the timber is kind of central to the work. Um, and I, 
only use timber from the one place that it's found, uh, whether it's like a garden fence. Do you want uh, to just tell us about the scale of that one as well? Well, that yeah, that one is um, it's uh, it's about five meters long, five and a half meters long, and eight foot high, and that was for a show at the Saatchi Gallery, which um, where they've given me this fantastic wall, and so it was my opportunity to make something really big. Um, and also this, uh, that, that bog oak as it is, which is like 5,000 years old, has been lying in, uh, what is it, alkaline or acid soil, I can't remember which one now. Um, uh, it's made it go black. So anyway, there was lots of it, so I could make a big piece. And generally, I'm restricted by the amount of timber I have collected. Um, and that does govern the, uh, the size of the piece to a certain extent. How, how do you get, um, just if I notice, I've got this old timbers sticking out of the bog and you can take it away? <laughs> <laughs> uh, with, with, the, with the bog oak, um, I know a man. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a kind of dealer. He, he gets called by the big food producers in Norfolk uh, and these huge <coughs> conglomerates um, because these huge logs are slowly rising to the surface and they get caught by the tines of the cultivators um, and so they get on the hotline to Hamish and Hamish goes up from Kent with his low flat loader, flatbed trailer uh, and he, he puts them on the back of his trailer and drives him back down to Kent. What does he do with them? Uh, he leaves them in the middle of a field for quite a long time and then he cuts them up um, and he sells any good wood for, to furniture makers uh, and he lets me have all the stuff that falls to one side. Uh, and so he rings me every year and tells me what he's got. Um, and it is absolutely beautiful, extraordinary stuff. Um, uh, but yes, that's uh, and this one actually the is Eastbourne Pier, isn't that's it? That's Eastbourne Pier. Yeah. yeah. So that so that was made with timber that had been charred from the uh, fire in September the year before last, mm -hmm. whenever it was. So just ask quickly then, was that part of your decision-making process to spend as little as possible or nothing on materials? <laughs> well, it's it, basically <laughs> for it, <or> scavenge <laughs> or make connections? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a financial, it wasn't a financial decision because it's, it, you know, for the amount of timber I use, I use very, very small amounts of timber really, it wouldn't, it wouldn't add much to the cost, but it, it kind of, um, Well, I started by using timber that had had a previous life, and uh, you know, whether it was you know roofing battens or uh, a fence or a notice board. Um, so it became part one of the best bits, you know, and it's still a bit I really enjoy is 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 finding this stuff, you know, or getting it, having an eye, you know, find, seeing it, and kind of. You know, in the case of Eastbourne, in case of a peer piece, you know, the kind of negotiations to be able to take it off the, take it off the beach. So but no, so it wasn't, it wasn't an expense thing. It was more that it, it's like the choice being made for me about what I could use. So it's way. like a starting point for each piece. So you start with the material and then it evolves from there. Yeah, rather no. Rather than having an idea in your head, I want to Absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. It start, it, it's the timber that leads the way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, mostly it's the colour um, that is uh, which interests me the most. And so it's just a way of somehow getting that across uh, as simply as possible. But other times it isn't colour at all. It's relief and texture. But yeah, so if that, I see the timber and then decide how it's going to work. But it's a big story as well. Is is the sto the Eastbourne Pier the biggest story? Um, it's it's Eastbourne. Well, I don't know. It's of it and its story. I don't know. No, I've uh, I've 
I don't know, they've all got good stories. I mean, I made a piece uh, from the notice board that, because uh, I used, when I took my uh, youngest to uh, Mockham every day, I noticed that the, the lamb notice board um, was uh, kind of, I'd, I'd always had an eye on it. <laughs> uh, and it hadn't really been used. And then when I thought was they refurbished it, I noticed that it had gone. And so I went in and um, asked him if I could have it. And he said, yeah, I could have it. You know, they've all, they've all got quite interesting former existences. Um, I mean, I suppose that's kind of possibly the most impressive or historic, maybe, the peer stuff, because, you know, there was I was cutting through the, the old kind of ballroom floor, you know, uh, which was a beautiful sprung floor, and the lino, you know, that they put on top of it before the games, you know, the amusement games went on. Yeah. So there was a lot of history there, like was like archaeology, you know, in the layers. But the, a lot of them had um, have good stories, you know, the the footpath signs which we looked at earlier, which are all fallen footpath signs from the South Downs. So they've all got just tiny little bits of colour where the, um, you know, where the lettering was. Um, yeah, but they're definitely the story is, it is central, central to, yeah, the origin. So let's go back to that. That's right, where we yes. Um, yeah, we were, talk, we were talking yeah. about what, what order things happened in yeah. and about you starting to make this work and applying for Origin, getting into Origin. Yeah. But, and, and obviously Origin was a big thing mm -hmm. because that was very successful for you. Mm. Was that also at the time, I remember you doing this thing where you were spending a lot of time walking, tramping around galleries, I think, yeah. and looking yeah. at... Yeah. Tell, tell us about that, about so, how you identified where you thought your work might fit. I think it was almost, it was just before, maybe before Origin, it was that summer before, I just started walking the streets of London, basically. Um, I mean, not all the streets of London, I did, <laughs> I did know where, roughly where I was looking, because I, you know, I was brought up in London. I, um, so I did just walk... Um, around just getting an idea of who might be receptive to what I was doing. But by looking at what they'd already got in By there. looking what what they'd already got. I was, you know, and I, and I searched the web as well, and I was, I just, I was just looking everywhere, really, to see who, you know, whether it was an aesthetic kind of similarity or, something in their kind of manifesto or whatever, just anything, because it, it was quite hard to find galleries that were kind of not very, not fine art or, you know, very painterly or whatever. Um, so, you know, there wasn't a huge amount of choice. So, and I went to our art fairs as well, of course, which is a great place to not walk the streets of London, you know, because a lot of the galleries there. Um, that's a really, really good place to see what's selling and um, to see and to meet people. Um, uh, so I did that, and I yeah, and I trawled the internet and I looked at magazines. So I kind of kind of had a a long list. And, from that. And so when you were going around galleries and going to art fairs and things, did you begin to sort of try to build relationships with people in the galleries at that stage or was that something I, that you did later? I can't remember when I, I think it might have been the year after or the year before I sent a like a new year card, which is in that box actually. Shall we get it out? Uh, my theory behind a new year card was that a Christmas card just gets buried. Um, and also because I used our Christmas tree, uh, so <laughs> it was kind of a, yeah, the idea was that, yeah, all the, all the Christmas stuff had been thrown out and that maybe they would see that. Or, um, know, what, did the you, what did you put in the card? Did you write in it? What? Uh, it just has, does it have <coughs> Happy okay. New Year on the back or yes. something, I think. Happy New Year on the back. Uh, and I think I would have handwritten a note. Mm. Um, and then following that, I did 
walk the streets again, mm -hmm. and I went into galleries that I thought should have my work, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and just made my present and said, I, I, you know, I sent through this. I mean, you do, you know, it, it's not, it's not for the faint-hearted. No, it's, kind of, it's hard, uh, isn't it? And you do so you have to kind of get, get this, you have to kind of get this, kind of, you have to believe that this is, you know, you're helping each other, you know, mm -hmm. this isn't, this isn't like, you know, you should be very grateful to a gallerist. You know, they're they're selling commodities. It's a shop, basically. You know, and they get fifty percent, and you get fifty percent. So, it's just whether they like your stuff or not. It's not a, uh, it's not a kind of personal thing. It's a commercial mm -hmm. transaction. But I think the key thing is, isn't it, to have done your homework in the first place? Absolutely. Wasn't that, uh, you know, one of the oh yeah, probably the most important thing at that stage is. Because if you'd sent your New Year's card to the wrong places, it would well, have been I, a complete waste of time. I mean, I, 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 I almost certainly did, you know, because I sent, you know, many more than I got any kind of... I, I didn't... I can't remember, you know, I might have lured one or two... You know, the, 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 but, the hit rate is very low. But, did, but the ones that you were successful with, were they ones that you'd followed up? Was it after the follow-up that you had the success with them? Did anybody actually get back to you just from the card? Um, there, was one, there was one gallery that got back to me from the card, I think. I can't really remember. Um, but they didn't end up being any really mm. use. Um, so was, uh, it, was it worth doing? Was it successful? The, what, that first card? No, just doing the whole, the whole process. In terms of, like, getting a reaction, you know, and I had my website by then, so I, I would go in, and if, you know, generally, there's no one in these places, I, and, you know, so they're quite happy to sit down, and, you know, we'd go through my website, and, you know, it was very useful in terms of just getting out there. But again, you know, this is me, this was, I know a lot of you won't want to, I, you know, I was being aggressively commercial at this stage. I really was. Well, I, you'd made your mind up, hadn't I'd you? I'd made that my mind up, oh, yeah. So it, but, you know, I wanted to make a living from this. Yeah. So um, what, what percentage of people, of all the galleries you saw, and all the galleries you did, what actual percentage of, of, of them actually responded to you? Did you ever get any gallery to take an interest in your work and show you your work? From that something? first one? Yeah. Um, Probably not. Uh, I think I had kind of long discussions with about three of them. Yeah. Um, but it, it was partly that I probably did miss. Uh, you know, I, I probably hadn't been aiming for the right places. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm almost certainly that was what it was. They were too commercial, probably, um, and uh, so no, I mean, it's certainly no one that I, I um, have conversations with now. But, Richard, isn't it part of the, the whole thing of, the whole process of actually doing it, and bulbs you to do it, and the point where you want to go more accurately by making sure that you keep approaching people, so even if they, it isn't successful that approach, that first or second or third approach. What it does is you hone the skills for approaching somebody you really want. To yeah, approach. yeah. I mean, it's just how many. Uh, definitely, that you know, there, there are. There's always something positive to come from, but it's just how many times you sort of want to be. I mean, they're all, yourself. Yeah, I mean, they're all. You know, it's all very polite, and um, you know, it's not. It's not like you get bruised, really. It's just. You can become disheartened, no doubt. But um, but yeah, I had, as you say, I had made up my mind. And then, so anyway, following those traipsing, traipsing around London, I did this origin show, uh, which was the first time that really any of the stuff had um, seen the light of day outside of the monkey. Um, so to, to, can you tell us a little bit about how that works? What did you have to do? To, to do that? Yeah, well, what did it involve? Because it was quite a big thing, wasn't it? The, like having a stand there. Mm. Well, you, you, make, you make an application and they look at your work uh, and decide whether it's appropriate of a, 
of a good enough standard or whatever. Uh, and then they give you a space, which you pay for, and then it's up to you to um, furnish it, really. Um, so it was quite a, a financial commitment, wasn't yeah, it, the yeah, first time? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, I mean it's, it's much more now. I mean, Crafts Council have stopped doing the show for some reason. Uh, they only did it once more, in fact, after that Somerset House one. Um, but yeah, it is. It is definitely. But it, it, was, it just seemed to me the best way of dipping my toe into the water. Um, and you have to get a body of work together as well, you know. Um, and I had quite a big stand. Uh, I can't remember whether it was like six metres long or something. Uh, you know, so I had, I had, I had to have sort of 14, 15 pieces. Um, this is your first show, yeah. from my understanding, and um, here you are, you, you pay for your stand, you've got in, yeah. and you put your body of work together, yeah. you now have to decide how to price it. Yes. How, how do you do that? Very unscientifically. Um, <laughs> I, I was still, still kind of slightly, um, you know, I inherited this from furniture making where you price according to how long something takes. Um, so I think that was probably my kind of guideline um, that I did kind of keep timesheets on things. So if I'd, once I'd made a piece and it had taken a week and I decided how much I wanted to charge an hour. Uh, and I still can't get rid of that. I still uh, find that is a good anchor for pricing. That thing of how long did it take? Uh, you know, some of the gallerists that sell my work are very unhappy about that, and they, you know, it's a perceived value, and that is when you move from, you know, Toby, who runs the Vigo Gallery, I, I mean, I let him price price it completely, you know, I just well, hold up my hands. You, you've, got, you, you know, you've got to start somewhere, and I, and I like the concept of having an hour rate or something. Yeah, I mean, it was just... It was timesheets. Timesheets. Well, that again is uh, I. I that was the hangover from making furniture, where I I used to keep timesheets on each on each piece I made, um, and uh, it was impossible, you know, because I didn't really there wasn't really anything to compare it with this stuff, so I couldn't really you know compare the market. Um, it was impossible to know uh, what was a, I mean, what is a reasonable price? You know, it's, a, it's, it's... Whatever well, someone wants to pay for it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and actually, after a little while, I think uh, you started making some slightly smaller pieces, didn't you, because they didn't take quite so long, is that right? You started off quite big, didn't you, and then did you scale I did, down I, a I, bit well at one I, stage? Well, I mean, again, I, I made the, the, you know, again, another commercial decision to make small pieces which, people would buy there and then. Mm. Uh, so, you know, which I sort of, well, depending on where it was, you know, at, a, at, a, at that fair, I think, well, at other places, you know, pieces this kind of size, which can sell even, well, through a gallery, can sell for like six or seven hundred pounds, which I know sounds like a lot, but in the places where they're showing, that is a kind of, what do you call it? When it, you know, when they buy spontaneously. Um, impulse buy. Impulse buy. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, but before that, before they were going through galleries, they were sell that was they were selling for like you know two hundred, three hundred pounds. Uh, so I, that was again another you know that was the kind of bread and butter money. But it was a it was a commercial decision to not scare everyone off. Um, you know, consolation prizes. <laughs> Um, so, so at, at origin, really, in a way, am I right in thinking that was kind of quite a breakthrough? That was, was, it, was that it? was ex that was extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Um, it went incredibly well, uh, and the main thing, and so I sold practically everything. I think I sold everything, and I got an enormous amount of orders, um, which I spent the next year, I think, making. Um, 
And is that but, where the sort of galleries began to Yeah, pick the, up from the first well? gallery that saw me there was uh, this nice woman, Elizabeth Murphy, who was running a gallery called the Murphy Mackin Gallery. And she came up and said this should be shown in the gallery and she got in touch with me afterwards and she took two big pieces to the delightful affordable art fair and uh, sold them straight away. Um, so that was all very encouraging. That, ha that happened very soon after Origin and then uh, so, and they were like they were like sort of four foot by four foot pieces so they were they were you know, they were kind of significant money, uh, which was uh, which was very encouraging. Can I just clarify? Mm. People that buy at Origin, they just people that are just from the public. Yeah. Are they galleries or they? No, no, no. It's, 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 public. it's absolutely right. yeah. It's it's a kind of high end craft fair basically. Um, but it's, in, a like, it's a bit like made. A bit like made, yeah. Um, yeah, I've actually, I don't think I've ever been to me, but I do know. Well, that's sort of a high-end craft. Yeah. I mean, I've applied for sort of, sure. not that one in the art but it's sort of just individual sort of Yeah, but exactly, yeah. That, exactly that kind of thing, yeah. Um, and so then, how are we doing? Yeah, we're okay. Uh, so, yes, so, but at, at that affordable art fair, uh, I had already spotted another gallery, the Wolf Gallery, uh, that really did seem to have a similar. What I just liked what Nick was showing in his gallery, and he had a stand at the Affordable Art Fair, and so I went and talked to him, uh, and he said that someone had already told him to go around and see my stuff, and he was showing at that time, you know, a lot of work with where people were making big things from lots of little things slightly like, obsessively. Uh, and so although aesthetically they didn't really tie together through process, they did. Uh, so he seemed keen. Uh, so I went and saw him and he started taking my work. Um, so that was great. And he, but the good thing about Nick was that he works incredibly hard and he goes to fairs all across the world, uh, he's, you know, I think he spends like half, half of, not so much now, but half of his time on the road, um, in the States, mainly, um, well actually, yeah, huge majority are in the States, um, so... Can I just ask, does he, does he tell you, sorry, can I just No. Does he, does he tell you what he wants, or do you... No, no, well he, he tells, he tells me what people like, you know, uh, and actually he's probably the most, um, you know, make another of those kind of thing, you know. Um, but, and, and I suppose the, the main restriction is size, you know, so he'll say what size he can do or what size he, he suggests. Um, and he will be, you know, he just says, you know, he'll say the colour he wants, you know, literally, and, and he would like. No, he doesn't necessarily get it. But um, so yeah, he 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 took he you know I started creating up my stuff and he he would take it off to the states and he was selling it as well. Um, and he was much more commercial than, than Elizabeth Murphy was. He, he he absolutely was working hard to make a living and he had been he'd been doing it for 10 years before I met him, um, he's still going, you know. Um, so he's still showing your work with him? I'm not, no. Uh, he's kind of gone off on a kind of, it, yeah, it didn't really, it, was, it became, it started becoming a bit quiet for mm. his stable. Mm. Do, do you have a conflict between what you think is commercial and what you want to do. If you get a piece of wood that's particularly talking to you in a particular way, but you know it's got you suspect it's not going to be commercial, would you carry on doing it? Or um, do you have a conflict? Well, it would, it, it would depend on uh, what 
what was kind of pressing at the time, I think, you know, if, because I always have in mind what I'm, what I'm making for, you know, whether it's a commission, you know, and commissions are yeah. not very enjoyable, really, because, you know, you, you, people have an expectation. Um, but, uh, no, I don't think, I don't think I would stop doing something because I didn't think it would sell. Um, but maybe in the back of my mind, probably, yeah, quite possibly. But I mean, it, I don't think it diverts me. Okay. But it may be always there, you know. Um, Are you worried about the, when you do these big pieces? Are you worried about kind of archival property when you can sell it? You know, mm. Are you worried that it's been disintegrated? No, no. I think that I always. I, 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 I mean, I wouldn't mind having woodworm. I, I would, I would worry about introducing woodworm into a very expensive house. But um, no, I think I see that as just a, you know, continuation of the story. Yeah, I mean, people. I mean, I sold this piece to. Uh, this nice woman who, you know, had a young family and it was unframed, no glass, and you know, she was worried about, you know, sticky fingers and I and I quite like that idea, you know. Uh, it's just another <coughs> mark, isn't it? It's another blemish. I mean in terms of their retaining their colour and everything like that, I mean, you know, a lot of the colour comes from having been outside and you know, in ex fairly extreme uh, you know, so the idea of sun fading or anything is very unlikely, seeing as how a lot of the stuff has been outside for years anyway. Um, there has been uh, a problem with some weathered oak, uh, which in initially is very, shows a lot of green, and then as it dries, the green kind of fades. Um, but otherwise, I, I think they're 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 pretty they're mu they're much more robust than you think, in a way. Um, so they were quite heavy. They were incredibly heavy, uh, but I've have slowly uh, learnt uh, ways of making them lighter. But um, because with crating for abroad, it's so important to try and keep weight down. Um, so. I've, I've kind of learned uh, kind of construction methods to yeah to keep 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 the weight down. And they are they're actually now deceptively light. Um, how they, are they in, in general? How are they? The, the canvases that uh, you know kind of well probably like a thick can canvas. You know they're, okay. they're sort of um, just under two inches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so did he class? Did he buy the pieces? No, no, no. So did you give them to them? Yeah. And trust them to them? Oh, yeah. So you were investing in making them? Yeah. You kind of paid up front for all of that, and then he was yeah. actually acting as a Well, I, I, I mean, I pay very little other than my time, but because um, fortunately, you know, this is when the, the, the material cost is relevant, because I'm um, you know, not like a silversmith or something where you're paying out hundreds of pounds of materials. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, you know, my, my material costs are zero. Um, well, not quite zero, but um, so. You weren't totally reliant on your income, so you presumably, so you had to yeah, so spend time. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I was still uh, at the bar left and everything. Oh, yes, it is. And when, <laughs> when you kept your work, you kept it for how long, or did you pass it on to other people? Um, he would. We talked about it. Sometimes he wasn't that brilliant at communicating, but often it stayed in the states because uh, there, are, you know, now art fairs have this whole uh, these kind of ancillary services, support services. So they they do the whole thing and they store it from one show. So that he used to show in Chicago and Miami, uh, so he'd keep it over there, so he didn't have to ship it backwards and forwards. And then, so, but you kind of, you know, you hope that it'll be gone, so you don't really expect it, you don't want to expect it back, really. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, paying up front, I, I don't know of any gallery that pays 
hazy before they solve it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a shared experience, really. Um, Did you have a contract then? No. You never had a contract? No. So if you went bankrupt after selling all your work, you would lost? If I'd gone back from no, if he'd he'd, gone back from. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, you have to. You, I mean, absolutely. You just have to trust these guys. But you know, well, you, you know, what you have to keep remembering is that this is their livelihoods. They, they are wanting to sell. You know. Um, yeah. Well, there are, there are competitions, aren't there? Uh, and open exhibitions. So, um, and I. I had that open west, uh, which was which was great, and and I did a residency for the open west. I'm not. Sure, I think it's still, it is still going, uh, but it's a very run by very two very very competent, strong women, and the, uh, and um, they kind of go to lots of different venues. Uh, and I did a residency for them that for a week in this fantastic. Uh, Tudor House in Gloucestershire. Um, uh, so there's that one. Uh, and Aesthetica, en en entering competitions. I entered the Jerwoods uh, Open Forest and got very close to. Um, I got to the last five. Um, but uh, didn't. Will you through. enter it again? Will I? Mm. Will I enter it again? Uh, possibly. It's biannual, isn't it? I, prob I probably will have forgotten the, <laughs> <laughs> the pain. The pain. <laughs> and I might well enter it again. Yeah. Um, and, and those sort of things, have they been useful financially? Or no. just as a sort of development no, just thing? as a development thing. Uh, but apart from galleries, the, the other, of course the other thing is commissions, which have come directly through the website from people who have seen my stuff. Uh, that has become, uh, although I don't welcome it, that has become quite a significant part of my work at the moment. Although I, I don't really enjoy commissions that much because they, like for example, there's a woman who saw that um, in Pimlico, in a gallery in Pimlico, and lovely woman, but it, she, you know, she was too poor to have a place that could fit it, you know. Um, so she uh, so she wanted a smaller one for her apartment in Paris, and so I made her a smaller one, but she had seen that, well, not that, but, you know, <laughs> she, she had an expectation, however much I told her that, you know, it wasn't going to be the same, the timber wasn't the same, and I don't copy and all that. And she said, no, that's fine, you know, um, you know, of course you must have a completely free reign. You still know that that's what she saw and what she liked. Um, and she was lovely and very supportive. And I went over and fitted it and she loved it. But it just, it just is at the back of your mind all the time. One good thing, one bad thing about working with galleries? Uh, well, the good thing is they do all the work. Yeah. Um, and they talk to people and they have... Um, and, you know, these fantastic um, mailing lists. Uh, uh, and I don't resent the money that they take at all. You know, they have incredibly expensive premises. Um, they, have, they have the, the patter, you know. Um, and I, 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 I do slightly miss being on the front line, but, uh, but so, that, so that's the good thing. The bad thing is that, you know, they take... 50, you know, 50, more than 50 percent. Do you feel at all constrained to keep the work in a similar vein, or? Yeah, yeah. I do, I do, and I'm start, I'm starting to, to break out. I'm starting to break out, but um, uh, no, I do definitely. But but in breaking out, then does the, is that the start of a whole new marketing process? Is it um, like pr you're pr now producing a new product line that you're now having to put out there? Uh, yeah, but I'm kind of edging it out there with people that I already know. So I suppose it's not, um, you know, I'm start starting to put it on the website and I'm starting to tell people about it. Um, so it's, it's kind of incidental. I'm hoping it's just sort of going to kind of creep in sort of thing.
I, I have, when I finish a piece, I, I, tend, I, 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 I tend to kind of strip a lot of it off and start again until I'm happy with it. But if it doesn't, and then if things, I mean, I've got like two pieces that, that are from 2011 or 12 or something, I still haven't sold, and they've been going to lots of places. And I do sometimes, you know, open up the crate and change them a bit, you know. <laughs> Um, so they are they are failures, you know, um, because they haven't sold. Yeah, you said that, <clears throat> that you um, applied for the German Forest thing. Yeah. And, um, does that mean that you're looking to make um, work for outdoors? Um, that project was, yeah, uh, and I have been asked about making stuff for outdoors um, before, um, but uh, and I did make a piece. I made a piece. That was water weather resistant, and I left it outside for a year. Um, uh, so, but as part of the process. Um, but I certainly have considered working and making stuff outside. Yeah. But this this particular Joe thing was actually slightly going back to the miniature thing. Because uh, they like, yeah. Because it seemed like a good opportunity to do something like that. Okay, we'll stop, I think. So, I just want to say thank you to Whitliffe so much for giving us <laughs>